this next topic is the topic that I uh, initially started with in my research on Jacobson syndrome, like I'm sure most of you know by now. I will preface this by saying some of this gets pretty technical, but I was just talking to Craig about this, and I told him this is in some ways some of the, mo one of the most challenging type of talk to try to make it meaningful to you guys without diluting its substance. And so having said that, uh, since we're all among friends here, if you want to stop and ask questions at any time, please do, and I will hopefully clarify. Um, don't get too bogged down in the details, but I think hopefully you can walk away with kind of the big picture of where we're going with this, okay? Any questions so far? Everybody cool? Good. So uh, I love this picture from a few conferences ago. These are four different children with Jacobson syndrome that all have hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, at least one of them is here today, actually. So they're all doing well, by the way. I should say one of them is physically here for the conference. So, uh, so in Jacobson syndrome, what we found is about half of all of your children have some kind of a major heart defect, and I'm not going to go through this laundry list except to say that of that half, or 56%, two-thirds have what we refer to as left-sided or flow heart defects. And there's a whole spectrum of severity. The one that I'm going to talk about today mostly is something called hypoplastic left heart syndrome that we'll, again, talk about. And then there's this whole range of other defects that either affect the other left-sided structures of the heart and also one of the most common ones is called a ventricular septal defect or VSD. So that accounts for about two-thirds of those that do have a heart defect. And then the other one-third have a whole smattering of other heart defects uh, that are less common. But to put this into perspective, if I took you to Rady Children's Hospital to our cardiac ICU right now, and if you looked at the list of the diagnoses, the cardiac diagnoses of all our patients in the hospital, and these are not Jacobson syndrome patients, the vast majority of those kids, their diagnoses actually also occur in Jacobson syndrome. That and the one that I'm most interested in is uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome happens to occur at an extremely high frequency in Jacobson syndrome. So together, what that means is, like I said, about half of your children have major heart defects. There's an unprecedented high frequency of hypoplastic left heart syndrome in Jacobson syndrome. And many, if not most, of the major congenital heart defects that occur in the general population occur in Jacobson syndrome. For those reasons, that made it very interesting and appealing to me. So I think by now, a lot of you have heard about hypoplastic left heart syndrome, but I'm going to put this out and ask you, how many of you, and I'm not saying this to embarrass you, how many of you actually know what hypoplastic left heart syndrome is? A few? Yeah? All right, well, here is a cartoon to point it out to you. So on the left is a normal heart, okay? So you can see the two main pumping chambers. LV stands for left ventricle, RV, right ventricle. Those are the two main pumping chambers. The right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs. The left ventricle pumps blood to the body. Um, by way of the lungs, there's what's called the pulmonary artery, which is the PA. And then to pump blood out to the body, that goes through the largest blood vessel in the body called the aorta, or AO. And then you have valves in the heart, just like we do in a car engine, that keeps blood flowing forward and hopefully not leaking backwards. So that's a normal heart. And in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, basically the right side of the heart is fine. But the left-sided structures of the heart are completely maldeveloped, such that, as you can see there, schematically in this cartoon, the left ventricle has a massively thickened wall such that there's a very diminutive chamber, so actual volume, so that there's not enough blood that can get pumped out to the body. And in addition to that, what classically goes along with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, besides the very severely abnormally developed pumping chamber, are the two uh, valves on that side. So there's the valve up that is between the left atrium and left ventricle. That's called the mitral valve. And then the valve that allows blood to go out to the body across the aorta is called the aortic valve. So that is a cartoon depiction of what hypoplastic left heart syndrome is. And for some of you families who have had a child with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, you know that without almost immediate intervention, it is a uniformly fatal congenital heart defect. This is, on the right side, a actual hypoplastic left heart heart from a baby that did not survive. 
And I think what you can appreciate compared to the schematic drawing on the left, most importantly, is this massively thickened left ventricle, right? Look how massively thickened that chamber is and look at how diminutive that volume is. So there's almost no way, there is no way for that ventricle to be able to pump blood out to the body because it can't accommodate the blood volume that is needed. Now, when we talk about the mechanism, no one really knows that to this point what the mechanism is underlying what goes wrong to give this fatal heart defect. But I can tell you that the most common prevailing theory, believe it or not, to explain how you go from a normal thin-walled left ventricle on the left side there to this massively thickened chamber wall, the left ventricle on the right side, the prevailing theory is that this is due to decreased growth. Now think about that. How can that possibly... Yeah, you're shaking your head. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. I can tell you. Look at the literature. It's unbelievable. And it's because I think people get caught up in the terminology of hypoplastic, which means underdeveloped. But I can tell you, at this point, we may not know what that abnormal growth is, but there is no way anybody can convince me that that massively thick and left ventricular wall is due to decreased growth. It's got to be increased growth, right? Does anybody not agree with me? All right, well, the whole field of cardiology disagrees with me up until now, but <laughs> hopefully we'll change that. All right, so to give you a little perspective of the epidemiology, so almost 1% of all newborns are born with some kind of a congenital heart defect, and yet about 2 to 4% are born with hypoplastic left heart. For some reason, there's a slight preponderance of males to females. These days, by routine fetal ultrasounds, most of the time, but not always, it can be diagnosed and is diagnosed prenatally. So in the United States, there's somewhere around 1 to 2,000 infants born per year which doesn't sound like a whole lot, except when you consider what the incredible morbidity is from this defect. It still is the most common cause of death of all infants that are born with any congenital heart defect. And as we talked about earlier today, it continues to be the most common cause of death in children with Jacobson syndrome. In terms of dollars, it directly is, I'm sure, costing this country over a billion dollars per year. And for those of you who have had a child with a complex congenital heart defect, you know what other impact it has, the time loss from work, the effect on the family, the emotional stress, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a big, big problem. All right. So with that as background, what I thought I would do so I don't completely bore in the hell out of you and lose you for the next 45 minutes is I'm going to actually give you the punchline, and hopefully you still won't be bored after this, but the punchline is... As I showed you on that schematic figure, there are different parts of what make up hypoplastic left heart syndrome. There's the problem with the ventricle itself, and then there's the problem, let's say, with the aorta and the two valves, okay? So what people have believed is that if you have a defect in, let's say, the aortic valve as the first step in this process, that blocks normal blood from flowing into the heart as it's developing. And because of that, what's thought is blood flow is actually a stimulus for growth. So people refer to the flow theory of hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and what they're actually trying to argue is that if you have a blocked aortic valve that acts like kind of a dam, that compromises normal flow and you get this quote-unquote decreased growth. Okay? That just does not hold up. What I'm showing you here is actually what I think is very logical, is that it's sort of a two-hit mechanism. And I'm going to show you a profound example of that in a few minutes. What I mean by a two-hit mechanism is, yes, you have to have the first hit to affect the aorta and the aortic valve. Okay, that's fine. Well, it turns out plenty of people have defects with the aortic valve, but their ventricle develops fine. So that can't be the entire story. The other part of the story that we've learned through our gene in 11Q, your gene, is that there has to be another hit that affects the development of the ventricle. So it's actually this two-hit model that we think is what explains hypoplastic left heart syndrome in Jacobson syndrome, and we're beginning to think or explore what I think is extremely likely that that is the model that's going to be relevant to the other 98% of children that have hypoplastic left heart syndrome that do not have Jacobson syndrome. Does that make sense? So a multi-hit model. So I just kind of went over that. The flow theory, which just doesn't hold water as far as I'm concerned. 
I think the more satisfying model is the third thing that I have there, this multi-hit model. To give you a little bit idea of an idea of uh, how people do once uh, they've been diagnosed or born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, depending upon other uh, morbidities, there can be a fairly high mortality in the infant period. There's actually no cure for hypoplastic left heart syndrome, but uh, we do have surgical approaches in which we basically reconstruct the right side of the heart to do the work of the left side of the heart. And actually, there's a family here from Oregon whose daughter is 19 years old who has gone through this three-stage surgical approach and, thank goodness, is doing overall quite well. Um, but it's not a cure. And... Um, other factors can contribute to the long-term outcome. There are other genes that can affect how well that right ventricle functions uh, to compensate for a non-functioning left ventricle. So, in most cases, uh, in terms of the genetics, there's not a known specific genetic cause. And actually, like I alluded to, Jacobson syndrome is one of likely many different genetic causes of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Okay, so I showed you this uh, picture earlier. So this little boy I was taking care of in my first month of cardiology training in July of 1995 because basically he has a variation of hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And back then we didn't do the fancy array comparative genomic hybridization analysis that we do today, but this is what we did do back then. And many of you have seen this kind of picture. This is a karyotype of the chromosomes, and I think you can easily appreciate, I don't know where my arrow is here, there we go, it's kind of fading. Uh, you can appreciate that this chunk of chromosome at the long arm of chromosome 11 is missing, and therefore is likely the cause of that child's hypo or version of hypoplastic left heart. And so obviously what, it, what I set out to do is figure out what is the gene or genes in that region that's missing that must be the cause. And so. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we took advantage of this technology uh, that I've mentioned before, the Array CGH, in, we can, in which we can look at every part of every, of every chromosome to see what's missing. And nowadays, most of you whose children are probably no more than about 10 or 15 have had this study done as actually the first-line diagnostic test. And what you see, what you get is actually a readout with specific numbers, kind of like a road map or like a mileage marker to tell you exactly where on that chromosome the deletion is and what's missing. And thanks to the Human Genome Project that I mentioned earlier today, we can get a readout of exactly which gene. So that's sort of the clinical application. In research, as shown here, what we could actually do is find some other rare patients that had a deletion in that region, but instead of like the blue line there going out to the end of the chromosome, these other patients had what we call interstitial deletions that are deletions within the chromosome that also had many of the aspects of Jacobson syndrome, including the heart defects. And so what we hypothesized is that if you look at that small region of overlap shown on that little bottom small black line, that within that region might be the causative gene. Okay, and thanks to the Human Genome Project, rather than trying to figure out what of 150 genes and that big blue line might be the cause, this actually narrowed it down to a very small region containing about six genes. And it turned out the ETS1 gene was already shown to have a very important role actually in heart development in a very interesting organism called the sea squirt, which happens to live in the ocean right off the coast here in San Diego. And sea squirts actually come in many different shapes and forms very beautiful, as shown here, and they actually have a heart. And this is a cartoon of the heart of a sea squirt from publica a publication of, from back in 1900. And basically, the sea squirt has a tube. It looks like an esophagus, but it actually pumps blood, or the counterpart of blood in a sea squirt. And this is an actual video of that heart beating. Now, this isn't exactly like a human heart, but there are some parallels in that it pumps blood forward through a muscle contraction type mechanism. And the nice thing about the sea squirt is people can actually study the individual cells from the earliest stage of conception throughout development to see what they do to give rise to that developing heart. Well, it turns out there are actually two pairs of related cells. Uh, there are two cells down below and two cells up above. Sorry, this doesn't project very well. And the two cells below 
are two muscle cells that end up forming that heart, whereas the two cells above end up forming the muscle of the tail of that organism. And so before, once we uh, identify this as a potential gene, this actually shows what we refer to as a genetic pathway by which in the sea squirt, the same gene that we've identified in your children, has been shown to be critically involved in two absolutely essential aspects of heart development. One is the determination of a cell to become a very specialized heart cell to do that beating. And then the other thing that has to happen is the heart is developing is, as you saw from that slide before, those cells actually have to move in a very controlled way to get to the right location to become the heart. Does that make sense? So already there is this very, very um, important information about the role of ETS1 in heart development in the sea squirt. But obviously the sea squirt is not a human. I think I showed this slide or mentioned this earlier today, and that is that even though we hypothesize that ETS1 is the cause of the heart defects in Jacobson syndrome, one could argue, well, maybe it's some of the other genes that are deleted as well, but this was a really important step forward from a few years ago in which a patient with a form of hypoplastic left heart was found not to have a deletion like your children, but just a very tiny mutation just in the ETS1 gene. And in fact, neither of his biological parents carried it. So that's what we call a de novo or a fresh mutation. So that was really a compelling argument to further support our hypothesis that it's really ETS1 that's the gene. So with that in mind, if that is the case, then what we want to do is try to learn everything we can in not necessarily the C squirt or C, the C squirt heart, but what about in something that's much closer to our human heart? And that's how, why then we turn to studying mice. So one thing that's very important that you probably don't appreciate about the heart is that there are actually a lot of different cells that make up the heart. So the most obvious one is what's called the cardiac myocyte. That is the heart cell that actually mediates that contraction of the heart. So it's a muscle cell. But it turns out there are a lot of other cells, cell lineages or cell types that are critical for the normal development of the heart and the normal formation of the heart. So the first thing we set out to do is if you want to make the argument that ETS1 is the cause of heart defects in Jacobson syndrome, then you want to determine if it is actually functioning or expressed in heart cells during heart development. And don't worry about all the blue. All this shows you is that we actually determine that ETS1 is indeed expressed in two cellular lineages that are actually critical for normal heart development. And I'm going to tell you about both of those in a moment. The first one is called the endocardium, which is actually a layer of cells that lines that inner aspect of the ventricle. And it turns out what's very interesting is that endocardium, that layer of cells, has a critical role in signaling the ventricle as it develops. So that's one very important observation. The other population of cells where ETS1 is expressed is a population of cells called the neural crest. And I'm going to tell you more about that in a moment. So just hang on to that thought, two different cell lineages. And what that really then does is it broaches the question, if we want to make the argument that loss of the ETS1 gene is what causes heart defects, and in this case, specifically hypoplastic left heart syndrome, then what we have to be able to show is then, can the loss of ETS1 either in the neural crest or the endocardium or both give rise to a hypoplastic left heart? And just to go back to what I already sort of poisoned the waters with, and that is, think and keep that in mind as we talk about this two-hit model that I told you about before. So. How do we go about doing that? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the neural crest. So this is a cartoon showing what's referred to specifically as the cardiac neural crest. So it turns out neural crest is a population of cells that in the developing embryo starts out in the neural tube, so the nervous system. And these cells, as depicted there, migrate to different parts of the body, including the heart, to help form the final structures of, in this case, the heart, or craniofacial features, or peripheral nerves, and skin. So it's a very complex group of cells, and within that group, there's a subset that we call the cardiac neural crest. And as you can see here, those cells are programmed, genetically and otherwise, to specifically migrate at exactly the right time 
to certain parts of the heart to help form those specific structures. Okay? So it's an incredibly elegant biological system, and somehow that must, if it goes wrong, perhaps cause heart defects. So we actually have the opportunity in mice and other model organisms to specifically eliminate any individual gene, either in the whole organism or specifically in certain populations of cells. And what we were able to show here is this is a three-dimensional reconstruction of an MRI done on a mouse embryo in which we have genetically eliminated the ETS1 gene. And I think you can appreciate on the left, that is a normal heart from a mouse, which is basically exactly like our heart, four chambers. That white horizontal line on the lower left corner is, and I, is to give you the size scale that we're talking about. That line is one millimeter. So we're talking about a heart that's about the size of a grain of rice, basically. And yet, just like what some of your kids have had, clinically, we can do this on mouse hearts, mouse embryonic hearts. And very, most importantly, in the mice in which we knock out or get rid of the ETS1 gene, and specifically in the neural crest population of cells, we get a heart defect called double outlet right ventricle, which is really a hole in the heart, or a VSD, which I hope you can appreciate by that line. And if you compare to the left, if you look at the aorta, which is that red vessel, if you look on the left, normally the aorta, as I showed you before, is lined up over the left ventricle. In double outlet right ventricle, you have a hole in the heart and the aorta is pushed off to the other side, lined up with the right ventricle. And we've gone on further to characterize what's wrong with these neural crest cells. And what we have shown on that upper left panel, A and B, is that's a cross section through an embryo's basically body, okay? And if you see those red splotches on panel A, that's from a normal embryo. And what we see in panel B from an embryo that's missing the ETS1 gene is there is a profound loss of these neural crest cells. So that's already very interesting to tell us that in the absence of ETS1, for whatever reason, there aren't enough of these neural crest cells, perhaps, that are making it out to form those structures. And that those vertical bars just are a way of quantifying how many cells in the wild type or the normal compared to the mutant. Another thing we've been able to do is to begin, like you heard with the immunology talks, to look at the function of these neural crest cells in the normal and then in the knockout, the ETS1 knockout mice. And on the lower part of the slide, what you see is on the left, a piece of that tissue where the cardiac neural crest cells come from put onto a Petri dish. So you see that blotch in the middle, and then you see all those little white dots. Each one of those white dots are neural crest cells that are actually migrating out into the Petri dish, sort of mimicking what happens in the living embryo. And I think what you can appreciate on the right is if we do that same experiment where you're missing that ETS1 gene, now you have two situations, fewer cells, and when incubated over the same period of time, I think you can appreciate they're that, that they're not moving as far out as what we normally see, okay? And so that actually identifies a second problem with these neural crest cells, meaning there are fewer of them to start and they can't move as well to get to where they need to go. So you can imagine it's like a double whammy to help explain why they're not getting out to that developing heart to do what they're supposed to do. Okay. So everything I just told you about is in the mouse, right? Or in the sea squirt. What about for your children? So remember in my talk this morning, I told you about the Nobel Prize that was uh, given out in 2012 to two investigators that could, that uh, developed the technology to allow you to take your child's skin cells, reprogram them to what we call stem cells or pluripotent stem cells, and then reprogram them again to any type of cell that you want. Well, it turns out here in San Diego, I'm very blessed to have a collaborator who has figured out how to reprogram those pluripotent stem cells to become, guess what, neural crest cells. And I'm not going to belabor the point other, to say, other than to say that we can do this basically in a Petri dish. We've now done this on three children. Two have Jacobson syndrome and hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and the third has not a whole deletion, but it's that patient that was published that just has that point mutation in ETS1. And don't get bogged down by this slide, but all I'm going to do is show you this picture here. So the red is 
the number of cells that migrate out over time in the three controls. And if you see here below, the three patients all have decreased migration over time compared to their, wild, or their controls. And so what that means is we actually now have, for the first time, a human system to study the disease that some of your children have that is totally consistent with what we've learned from the animal model. And moving forward, that gives us an opportunity, with some more funding, Laura, to be able to identify the genetic pathways, and we think maybe to identify targets that would allow us to, let's say, when someone is contemplating becoming pregnant, to maintain the integrity of these neural crest cells by through folate, for example, like many of you take when you're pregnant for other types of defects, which, which also happen to be neural crest defects. So that's where we're going, but now we've got a very powerful system to study that. I should also show you, this is a very busy slide, but all I want to show you here is that um, I mentioned to you that one of the problems with these neural crest cells from the ETS1 mutants or from your children is a migration defect. So we've actually taken it one step further and we can actually begin to look at the mechanism of what causes the migration defect. And it turns out cells have specific molecules that allow them to trap, okay? And those are called cell adhesion molecules. And all I want to show you is on the top are normal cells, neural crest cells, and on the bottom are neural crest cells that are stained for a marker of these cell adhesion molecules. And we see more green in the bottom than the top. You'll have to take my word for that. But what that's actually telling us, as is consistent with what's already known, is that the mechanism underlying this migration defect is due to having too much of this cell adhesion molecule, which basically makes these cells very sticky. So they're just kind of getting stuck as they're moving to where they need to go. So that's kind of a really great step forward to begin to understand the mechanism and to maybe potentially find a target to overcome that. Okay. So, I'm very excited about this uh, progress in terms of the component of the, the neural crest component. But what I haven't shown you so far is what I was hoping to get, and that is by knocking out the ETS1 gene in the mouse to be able to get a hypoplastic left heart in a mouse. That would be ideal, but we don't have that. And there are likely, it's probably for the same reason why only a few of you in this room even though all of you have a child with a deletion, only a few of you of your children actually have hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And the reason for that is it's very complex and that there are other factors. So now I want to take you on a little bit of a journey for some very recent progress and very exciting progress. Anybody know what this is? This is what you swat every day around your fruit bowl. This is a fruit fly. Well, it turns out the fruit fly has a lot of uh, similarity to us in terms of genes and heart development, believe it or not. So this next slide shows you, in the upper left corner, the normal heart of a fruit fly. And I don't know how well this is going to show up with my pointer. OK, can you see my arrow? See these, this, these two horizontal rows of dots? That is the heart of a normal fruit fly. What those are are the heart cells of a fruit fly, and it is just a tube. It's a single layer tube. But it actually turns out that many of the same genes that are required for the development of our heart are required for the development of that heart. And it turns out about 12 or 14 years ago, there was this publication, I didn't even know about this at the time, that shows what happens to a fruit fly heart if you mutate our gene, the ETS1 gene. And each of these other panels shows you the heart of those fruit flies that are missing the ETS1 gene. Anybody want to comment on what you see that's different? It's thicker. And what do you see? You see more cells. What did I set you up for the kill for earlier in my talk, right? Well, guess what? I looked at this and I thought, my goodness, this is hypoplastic left heart in a fruit fly, maybe. But for the first time, it actually gave me the beginnings of trying to understand maybe what the mechanism is underlying that massively thickened ventricle. And to take it one step further, this is tissue from a baby with Jacobson syndrome with hypoplastic left heart syndrome that died shortly after birth. And you'll have to take my word for it, but what we're seeing here is exactly analogous to what I just showed you in the fruit fly. 
extra heart cells. The heart cells themselves don't look all that abnormal, but you have a whole bunch more of them. Okay, so that was very exciting because that allows us now to connect back from the fruit fly to the human situation, at least for Jacobson syndrome. Now, I mentioned this morning I have a collaborator at Caltech who is also interested in the ETS1 gene. And she has been with her former postdoc, who is now a junior faculty at Emory. Um, she was also interested in the role of ETS1 in heart development in the frog. And this is a busy slide, but what I'm going to show you is normally a frog has, if you can see my arrow there, a single ventricle, okay? And then up here is sort of the frog version of the aorta, or what we refer to as the outflow tract. So that's the normal aorta or outflow tract of a frog, and that's the normal ventricle of a frog. So it's one ventricle and one outflow tract, okay? Now, in the frog, just like in mice, we can actually selectively eliminate the ETS1 gene in these different populations of cells. And so in this middle panel is what happens when you selectively eliminate the ETS1 gene just in that same population of cells that I just talked about, the neural crest. And what you see here is exactly consistent with the multi-hit model that I was telling you about. Compared to the normal, this aorta or outflow tract is very abnormally developed. But look at this. The ventricle is completely normal. And this is a compelling observation because it totally supports what I have believed from day one. And it totally contradicts the believers of the flow theory, and that is you can have a messed up aorta, but the ventricle develops fine. So then the question is, then how do you get hypoplastic left heart syndrome? Well, the obvious answer is there must be another factor. And so in this section on the right, what they did is they actually knocked down ETS1 effectively in the progenitors or the, few, the heart cells that give rise, or the progenitor cells that give rise to that other layer of cells that I told you about that's expressed that's expressing S1, namely the endocardium. And here is, where's my arrow? Here is the ventricle when you get rid of endocardium. What do you see, Jessica? Yeah, you see the same thing. You see this, oops, you see these extra cardiac myocytes. Actually, the outflow tract is also messed up. But most importantly, this fully supports the model that it takes two hits, one in the Neurocrest and one in the endocardium to get you hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And let me show you a normal frog. I don't know how well you can see. It's probably not going to show up too well. I don't know. If, can we shut down the lights? I don't even know where. Well, the heck with it. But anyway, this is a normal uh, tadpole, basically. And what you can see if the lights were shut down is that if you look over there, you see this little pulsation. And that is actually ink injected into the cardiovascular system of this tadpole. I don't know if you want to try it. Because it's such a cool video, right? <laughs> just go for it. <laughs> What's the worst that's going to happen? We all... Just shut down the entire yeah, just shut down the whole thing. What the heck? <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, so these are normal tadpoles. And let me show you what happens to these tadpoles when you knock down X1. Basically what happens is these tadpoles die, and it's kind of hard to appreciate, but they're all swollen, and what these are are tadpoles that are dying from heart failure, and it's most likely because their hearts were not normally developed, and in fact, we've already shown that. So my uh, collaborator, Shui Ni, who was the postdoctoral fellow at Caltech, who is now at Emory, who I'm going to try to recruit to maybe join us here, is actually an embryologist by trade, and she came up with a very, very clever experiment. So she is continuing this work that she started at Caltech. And again, this is going to be pretty hard to show graphically, but I'll show you numerically in a moment. And what she did is she did the same experiment that she did before, where she knocked down ETS1 and created this hypoplastic left heart like heart in the frog, and then she took it one step further. At the same time she did that, she actually took normal progenitor heart tissue and grafted it to this developing heart that was otherwise going to become a hypoplastic left heart. And remarkably, what she was able to show is that by grafting this normal progenitor heart cell tissue, it actually prevented hypoplastic left heart syndrome. 
And this just numerically shows those results. So uh, control, meaning normally, they're normal, eight out of eight. If you just knock down X1 by itself, 82% of the time you get the abnormal heart. But if you do that and simultaneously graft this progenitor heart tissue, you rescue or prevent it uh, in a high percentage, in 60%, when normally you'd only have about 18%. So that is very compelling for two reasons. One, it is consistent with our model that there's some other factor, namely, presumably, the endocardium that's involved. But what, to me, is most profound about this, which I believe is totally transformational for the whole field of pediatric cardiology, is that it suggests the possibility that with early enough intervention, there may be a, win a window of opportunity to prevent this. And that would be absolutely mind-boggling. Okay, so basically I've just summarized uh, what's on, the, I've just discussed what's on this slide. So taking this one step further, just to kind of go over our thinking at this point. So we think that hypoplastic left heart syndrome is a disease of both the ventricle and the outflow tract or the aorta and the valves of so this multi-hit model. Loss of S1 results in this increase in the cardiac myocytes, and actually, in, at the same time, what appears to be a loss of these endocardial cells. And these are steps that are happening very early in heart development. So I want to share with you some very, very recent results that take this even one step further. We've already known that, as I alluded to before, there are signals from that population of cells lining the inner part of the heart called the endocardium. The endocardium secretes specific signals that are required for the normal development of the left ventricle, and that's just shown in this uh, cartoon. And we actually already, not my lab, but others before me, have identified what a number of those genes are, what this pathway is. And so we went back and looked at the expression of those genes in those hypoplastic left hearts from the frogs. And don't worry again about the details, but you see that big red bar? That's telling us that when we knock down X1, to cause hypoplastic left heart, at least one of those genes is profoundly upregulated, so expressed or functioning at a much higher level of activity than normal. And it turns out this gene is an extremely interesting gene. It's a gene called BMP10, you don't have to worry about that, but what it does is it is a stimulator of cardiac myocyte proliferation. So now, remember what I just told you a minute ago, if you graph this tissue, to the developing heart that's otherwise going to become a hypoplastic left heart, something about that tissue is helping to prevent or rescue hypoplastic left heart. Now we think we might even know the specific gene that's mediating that process, which means, I don't want to say this too loud because I could be totally loud, wrong, but if we could find an inhibitor of BMP10, that could be a target or a strategy for preventing hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Now, X1 is part of a family of genes that we just call X transcription factors, and there's actually already a precedent for another member of this family that regulates this sort of two-way decision process between actually whether you're going to have an endocardium cell, endocardial cell, or a cardiac myocyte. And again, what this is beginning to tell us is that in the, when you lose X1, you lose endocardial cells and you gain cardiac myocytes. So one of my very last slides that I'm going to show you is actually from an experiment that we started planning about a year ago that Lou, who was here earlier today, just pulled this off and just literally got, me, got these results last week. So here's the idea. Everything I showed you so far for hypoplastic left heart syndrome has either been in a fruit fly or a frog, but what about in a mouse heart? What we were able to come up with is a strategy to test our hypothesis that it's really the endocardium that may be the sort of smoking gun in causing this abnormal left ventricle. So what we were able to do through some genetic trickery is during early stages of heart development basically eliminate endocardial cells. And we can actually, again, through some genetic trickery, trickery just basically kill the endocardial cells during early heart development. And let me show you, this is a very, very preliminary result. I'm only showing you this because you're my friends, and I'm not saying it's going to hold up, but if it does, it will be very profound, because this is a section through a heart of a normal mouse embryo, and basically what I'm showing you here is the normal developing left ventricle, okay? Up here, 
is the left ventricle from a mouse heart in which we've genetically gotten rid of those endocardial cells. And this is at a very early stage of heart development, but I think you can appreciate the profound difference in this ventricle compared to this ventricle. And over time, we will look at this at later stages of heart development. The problem is these hearts are so abnormal, they're probably going to die pretty soon, relatively early. So we can't quite take this out probably to full-term gestation. But it's already a very, very piece of evidence to support our hypothesis that knocking out the endocardium might have a profound effect and role in causing hypoplastic left heart syndrome. So everything I've told you about so far is about X1 and Jacobson syndrome, which to me is great already. But, you know, when I'm trying to sell grants or trying to convince the foundation and why they want to try to sell this to philanthropists in the community, quite honestly, they're not as invested in Jacobson syndrome. But what about for the general population and people with congenital heart disease? So this next slide is, on the left, a heart that was from an 18-year-old young man last summer who was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome and eventually developed heart failure, and so he had a very successful heart transplant. It's quite a fascinating story, but uh, that's his explanted old hypoplastic left heart. So again, you see that massively thickened ventricle. And the Genomics Institute was able to do whole genome sequencing on this young man, and actually they couldn't find a genetic mutation anywhere in ETS1 or any of the other 23,000 genes. So we don't know what the cause is, but that's not uncommon. That's more the rule than the exception if you take all comers with hypoplastic left heart. But if you look at that middle panel, that is a, a microscopic view of his heart tissue, and guess what we see? exactly the same thing that I just showed you for ETS1. Just a whole bunch of cardiac myocytes. That has got to be the explanation for his massively thickened left ventricle. That middle panel is his left ventricle tissue. The right panel is actually tissue from his failing right ventricle. And normally, you shouldn't see blue. All that blue is basically an indication of scar tissue and why he ended up needing a heart transplant. So, I'm going to take you back to that slide I just showed you 40 minutes ago that hopefully now you'll appreciate a little bit more. And essentially, from ETS1, I think what we've learned is a whole lot. And that is that it's completely consistent with that two-hit model where you have to have something affecting the development of the valve and something else that's critical for affecting the development of that ventricle. Okay. This is that young man who had the heart transplant last summer. And it was actually amazing because I asked him, I knew he was coming up for, or actually, yeah, I knew he was going to be getting a heart transplant. And I asked him if he'd be willing to donate his heart to allow us to do these kinds of studies. And he said yes, but there is one requirement. And that is I, he wanted to hold his own heart. And so he uh, got his heart. Um, had the transplant and then was up at a rehab facility about 40 miles north of here. So one day I drove over to the pathology department in here in downtown San Diego. I got his heart, took it in a bucket, drove up Interstate 5 and brought him his heart. So it's the first time I've literally ever captured a patient's heart. All right, that's it. <laughs> Enough said. Um, so this is just a little summary of what I told you, how we started with a human Jacobson syndrome patient. And I think it's actually quite incredible how we've been able to use, either from the past, the uh, sea squirt and the fruit fly, and what we've been able to do with the frog and the mouse, and now coming back to the humans to learn a whole lot more, which I think is going to hopefully really lead to a much better understanding and maybe, if we're really lucky, prevention. And this, uh, as I've mentioned before, is not possible without having some great minds and hands, the two people that I introduced to you earlier in my lab. And before that, I had several other postdoctoral fellows. And it is truly, it takes a village. I have a lot of other collaborators, both here locally in San Diego and around the United States and even around the world. So um, that's where we're at. And again, I can't thank all of you enough because Thanks to not only your participation in the studies, but being able to get the support financially that you've been able to do, and hopefully moving forward, we can continue this.
So that's the end of my talk. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, uh, I think we're okay for time. We'll move right into the um, panel discussion to take questions, okay? All right, thanks. So Virgil and Ken, you want to come up here and join me? My grandson, okay, he ever a couple of years, you know, we go through everything. He had trace heart problems. Okay, the last time we went, aortic stenosis and parachute valve, can those heal as you get older, even for our children? Can they go away? Because they're saying they find nothing now, that he's, it's all right. gone. Right, so the question is, her son, Tristan, mm -hmm. grandson, excuse mm -hmm. me, um, has some defects that are sort of on that spectrum of what I showed as left-sided heart defects specifically involving the mitral and the aortic valve, so the two valves on the left side of the heart. And yeah, it's variable. So there's a whole range of severity and you can have relative narrowing or underdevelopment early on that potentially can grow and basically go away over time. But that's why everyone who has that early on has to be followed. Obviously. Well, you know, before you do dental work or anything, you're supposed to take antibiotics. And I, should I wait till I get one more? Um, doesn't that's not relevant it, anymore. Those recommendations were changed about. 12 oh, years ago. okay. So, yeah. so he doesn't need antibiotics. And, and it, well, not because of his heart. He might need it for other problems. Yeah, but, not for his heart. Um, but, yeah. but that actually can they actually can heal their. Stuff. Well, when you say heal, really, what's well, happening is from what you're describing, those two valve structures grew enough over time to keep up with him, so that basically the problem went away. That's what it means. And then on the same thing, um, my, I, I, he was going to a pediatric dentist. Yeah. And so, so everything's fine. So I didn't go to the last visit. Our friend took him, came mm -hmm. back and said, he needs, he needs his wisdom teeth pulled. I said, what? I said, what wisdom teeth? So I said, the other doctor never mentioned anything about wisdom teeth. So I, I said, this is serious. This is not a little thing. So right. I went to my dentist. And my dentist says, what are you talking about? His wisdom teeth are there. He said, I said, well, the other guy said they needed because they were hard to clean. He said, no, just fill the cavity, make him brush more. But that, the, the pa pediatric dentist, I just couldn't get through to him that this was not just a little, little surgery right. to take out four wisdom teeth. And they were already there. They weren't creating any problems. He just didn't think that Tristan could clean them good enough. Well, I, you know, fought with my dentist for years until I finally gave in about 10 years ago and had my wisdom teeth out. But I think, you know, I'm not a dentist, but um, most dentists, for whatever reason, believe that wisdom teeth, unless they're completely asymptomatic, need to come out. And so um, probably his will need to come out because they will, in my case, what, what, what was going to happen if I didn't have them out, they were going to erode into the teeth, the normal teeth in front. That would have caused me all kinds of problems. No, when he had, he had wear braces and there was enough supposed to be enough room there, well, and, and it, it was I just thought it was crazy. But for now, I I switched him to my dentist and they're yeah. going to clean them and better. And well, if you can take really good care and they're not yeah, causing problems, yeah. then not I, necessarily. I don't want to jump into right the because surgery. obviously with the bleeding problems, mm -hmm. having he's your, never like, had any problems. He's had surgery and never, had, but there'll yeah. be a first time with my yeah. butt. Well, yeah. you know it's more complicated in the background of having a platelet problem. So it's not to be taken lightly. Come on up. Paul, Dr. Grossfeld, on your, um, sorry, I'm a little nervous, I'm not great about speaking. You want a glass of wine? <laughs> All right. I'll be the um, poor. <laughs> um, I, I noticed you're looking at the genes, the ETS1 and the, is that the fly one, I believe? Uh -huh. And uh, we've been to my son, he's 11 months old, Carl, uh, his cardiologist, and they said he, ha he has no heart defects, but that does show on his microarray report. Yeah. So why would that show up, yeah. and is that something that's going to affect in the future? Right, so as I mentioned, about half of all children with Jacobson syndrome have a heart defect, mm -hmm. half of them don't. Mm -hmm. And by definition, virtually all of them have a deletion that involves the ETS1 gene. So this is one of the things that makes human genetics so complicated because 
it's not so simple. So that's actually defined as something called incomplete penetrance. And so what it means is the ETS1 gene clearly causes heart defects, but there are other factors that can contribute to determine actually whether or not you do have a heart defect. So your son sounds like he's in the lucky half that even though he's missing X1, there's something else that is a modifier to prevent. Okay, great. Um, and the other question is for Virgil and Ken. Um, now, do you, um, do you still um, think that all the, J even if they haven't been sick, should they have the immunology testing done and about what age, would you say? So, yeah, I think that it's um, worthwhile to test everybody at mm -hmm. least once. Okay. And it doesn't necessarily matter what age as long as you do it as early as possible, right? Okay. So even in some of the teenagers or young adults, I think there's some value to knowing whether there's any abnormalities there. No, what about like infants? So it's even more important probably in infancy okay. just to make sure that you're not uh, dealing with an uh, immune deficiency um, that would predispose your child to recurrent infections. Because you'd want to find that out before all of the infections sort of added up to some sort of suspicious situation. Right? Okay, so the earlier you know, the more knowledge you have to make decisions about what to do. Okay, great. Thanks. Just as a profound reminder, remember I mentioned that one of the first things that brought this to my attention was about a 16-month-old baby toddler that died from an RSV infection where no one had previously suspected immunodeficiency. So we don't ever want to see that. Thanks. All right. Feel better now? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is about the, the S1 gene mm -hmm. that um, how your colleague grafted it onto a hypoplastic heart uh -huh. of a frog, right? Yes. And um, the 60% success rate, uh -huh. was that for frogs then, or? Yes, that was in frogs. Okay. Right. Now, that's only can be done at the embryonic stage, is that correct? Right. Okay. Has that been done on any humans yet, or? No. Not yet. Not yet. Not the yet. next thing we're actually doing is, rather than a graphing experiment, what we're doing is we're doing a double knockdown, so we're going to knock down in the frog again, the ETS1 gene, which, again, causes the hypoplastic left heart. And we're also going to knock down that other gene that I showed you that is way overexpressed if we think that's the actual specific gene that's responsible for causing that ventricle problem. Okay. And the hypothesis is that even if we, that if we knock down X1, but we also knock down the mediator of X1, that mm -hmm. maybe that can rescue. And we're not quite there yet, but we have some Tantalizing, very preliminary results, but it's that. very it's very exciting. The other question is, if in the future, do you anticipate any kind of a of a gene um, grafting that can be done after you know post embryo? I think for hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the horse is out of the barn by the time you're born. Okay. So again, this is very speculative or hypothetical, but. If we could identify that target, it's going to have to be very early, first trimester. It's going to have to be using technology that we don't have now clinically to even make the diagnosis okay. of hypoplastic left heart. What I actually think is a more logical strategy, as I mentioned this before, you know, pregnant women take folate to prevent neural tube defects, right? Folate is thought to work by actually... Uh, helping to ensure normal neural crest cell proliferation. Hmm. We actually tried treating our mice, our mice with folate. It didn't work. So it's a different mechanism. But, you know, hypothetically, if we could find something like that so that if you're contemplating or are pregnant, maybe you just take something analogous to folate to, folate to prevent. Because I do think it's going to be quite a challenge today 
to be able to figure out a way to intervene in the first trimester. Okay. That's early enough to make a difference. Okay, one, one more question. If you have a child like, who has had a, um, a lesser heart defect, like mm -hmm. an ASD or VSD, mm -hmm. and has had it repaired, in this case it was Vortex, mm -hmm. U of M, I thought it was amazing, but is, is there a chance that that would lead to an increased amount of you know, heart issues in the future? Most likely not. Okay. They should be, and you think that it'll be. never need to be replaced? Or Shouldn't. Okay. Basically, when you have a hole in the heart mm -hmm. that's surgically repaired or repaired with a device through mm -hmm. a catheter, it should be a one-time and done. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, that's, you're hired, right? Yeah. So this is uh, more for the, uh, the immunologists. Um, in, in children who have deficient immune systems uh, or, or low T cell counts, has there been any research done into therapies like just regular bone marrow transplant from parents or, so, or something simple like that? Simple, <laughs> I say. Yes, yeah, so uh, T cell deficiencies are notoriously difficult to correct. So when the T cell deficiencies are severe, one of the things that can be done is bone marrow transplantation, right? Um, where the immune system of an affected child can be corrected by replacing it with an entirely new one from a healthy donor. For what we see in Jacobson syndrome, however, I don't think that that's something that we would consider because the severity of the immune deficiency, number one, is not well defined yet, and it can be anywhere from quite severe at birth, but then actually okay in the first several years, to something that was normal first and then maybe progressively gets worse. So. Definitive uh, treatment with bone marrow transplantation is reserved only for a few immune deficiencies at this time because of the complications from the, the actual procedure. So, probably not an option. Here's a more general question. What do you guys think about thymic transplant for certain T cell deficiencies? Yeah, so Paul's referring to um, thymus transplant specifically for a deficiency called um, DeGeorge syndrome, or 22Q11.2 deficiency. And that's a, I always think about that maybe as being maybe sort of related to Jacobson in that the immune deficiency for that particular disease is also highly variable. Some patients have very severe T cell deficiencies, and some patients have no immune deficiency at all. And in that disease, they can actually transplant uh, the tissue from the thymus gland of a healthy, I guess person you would call it, but a healthy, they're from, um, not healthy anymore people, but um, <laughs> uh, healthy people to uh, the affected individual, and it can restore immune function. I think that it works um, in those patients. But there's such a very small number of patients that would benefit from thymus transplant that it's not done so frequently. And in fact, my understanding is that there's right now a significant um, wait for thymic transplant because Louise is, um, she's reached the quota for her IRB. So I don't know. We have a patient here at Radies who's waiting to go to Waiting Duke. to go, yeah. They only do it and at one center so in the U, right. So yeah. they only have, uh, there's only one center that's really doing it in the U.S., and right now, um, my understanding is that there's none being done at the moment. That's, that's what, so that's why, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the backlog. That's yeah. for the immunologist again. Um, I was wondering, actually, uh, my daughter also has hypothyroidism, and um, at this point we don't know like, if it's Hashimoto's or anything, but is it possible that hypothyroidism could be caused by something that's not immune-related? 
So the question is whether it is not immune-related. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, one uh, point uh, well, I can make is that what we see here, we did an uh, analysis in our, let's say, patients with primary immunodeficiencies, or not specifically uh, adaptive Q patients, but what we found in patients with a, with a primary immunodeficiency, a significant number of patients have any kind of endocrine dysfunction. So what we see and what we know is that indeed immunodeficiencies might be related to, to endocrine disorders. That could be a relation. Secondly, uh, uh, is that primary immunodeficiencies are related to autoimmune disease. So we see the relation between immunodeficiency and autoimmune thyroid disease, for instance. But thirdly, uh, also autoimmune thyroid disease or thyroid disease in general are frequent, frequently occurring problems in the general population. So you could still speculate that indeed you have an immune problem and second, uh, secondary, uh, or not secondary because it's not related to the immunodeficiency, you can still have common endocrine problems like thyroid disease. So yes, the frequency in general population is that high that you could speculate that it is indeed not related to autoimmune disease or immunodeficiency. Okay. But There's we know that there is this relation. Okay, because she did have um, autoimmune testing, I mean, immune disease testing, and so they said her antigens and mitogens didn't proliferate properly. Is that something that, like, she can grow out of? <laughs> or is that kind of like, if your immune system doesn't work, it just doesn't work? Well, so with respect to, let's say, immunodeficiencies, I would say if you have an immunodeficiency, it's there. But the other hand, autoimmune disease, uh, they tend to have uh, different patterns. So you can have a very active autoimmune disease which stays active for a long period of time. But very uh, uh, often we see that autoimmune disease, uh, I'm talking about adult patients uh, that I see, they can tend to have this kind of patterns, activity, then declining in activity. But they can also see that it's very active for a certain period of time. Activity declines and autoimmune disease disappear. Oh, great. Yeah, Thank so you. that is uh, what, what we see uh, in autoimmune disease. So immunodeficiency, if it's there, I would say it's there. Okay. But autoimmune disease tend to have different kind of patterns, uh, actually. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question about um, immunizations. Is there a way for us to test whether or not they're effective for our children? So that's a good question. Um, so for all the vaccine preventable diseases, we can measure post-vaccination antibody titers to make sure that the immunization itself stimulated an appropriate immune response okay. and that your child or yourself made those protective antibodies. So that's part of the evaluation in regards to using Pneumovax, is that's what we're measuring. We're measuring whether the vaccination actually stimulated an immune response and triggered the production of protective antibodies. I think if you've proven uh, the production of pneumococcal antibody titers, mm -hmm. you could extrapolate that and say that your child has probably made protective antibodies to all of the vaccinations because the ability to respond to Pneumovax is a, a talent that occurs later in development, okay. not at birth. Okay. So if you've made antibodies to Pneumovax during the evaluation, you've made tetanus and diphtheria and all the other protective antibodies. So he's 12 now. Mm -hmm. We could have this test. Well, he would have to receive Pneumovax first. And then have this test? Before. Sure. Yeah, you could. That would be part of... Or would it um, not be necessary if he's not been hospitalized? Yeah, so... You know. it, it probably isn't necessary, but there wouldn't be a downside. Okay. And could a deficiency in IgM lead to... No, right. that's, a good, that's a good point. So you, in your case, you've already documented maybe some sort of abnormality with... Um, the immune system with the selective IgM deficiency. 
So in my mind, I would really want to look at those pneumococcal antibody titers to make sure that his ability to make specific antibodies is intact. Okay. And that even after he made those specific antibodies, that he can retain that protection over time. Okay. So you'd be a keeper in my clinic, and I would okay. follow you a little bit you know, and, and take some labs. If we need to make a trip down to see you, it I think be, we could make that work. We could make it work. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we could maybe you know, have some beignets. Yeah, I was going to say, we could do beignets. But we're not coming during. Uh, no, not yeah. until the fall and winter when the weather yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, no. I'm, what I mean is, no, my, I'm not bringing my husband down there during uh, the beads. Oh, Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. Thank you, Mardi no, Gras. Thank you. I thought that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I do have another question also. Sure. Um, could deficiency in IgM lead to um, ringworm and athlete's foot? Because he has had issues with both of those. So, Virgil and I have been talking about that. And I think that if any of the 11Q patients that have had um, some recurrent fungal infections, we would blame it on some T cell dysfunction as opposed to the antibody okay. dysfunction that so we see. That yeah, so there's probably some, some version of a T cell functional problem. Even if the T cells are present in normal numbers, they're okay. clearly not working that great. Now, there's another example of a disease that's also very common, right? So tinea, so superficial right. skin infections with fungus are common, but not to the degree that I think you see in patients with Jacobson. So the severe, difficult to treat, um, persistent uh, tinea or fungal infections, we don't really see in the general population. It's a one and done. You use, you know, some athlete's foot cream and it goes away, right? right? But when it doesn't do that and keeps coming back or you just can't clear it, that's a problem with the immune system. Okay. Would, this, would you also apply that to something like a dandruff problem? Because he's had, yeah. like, that where he's scratched his scalp off because it... Yeah, so she... Know. So the question is, is... Uh, Seborrheic dermatitis or dandruff related to that superficial skin infection we call ringworm or fungal infections? And the answer is yes. So sometimes sebderm or really severe dandruff is the result of colonization with, a, a, with fungus, and there may be some relationship to that. So oral antifungals sometimes can help with that. Oh, okay. Well, we didn't try yeah. that, so I'll try that. Um, could an immunodeficiency be related to recurring um, ear um, drum ruptures in the absence of ear infections, or at least symptoms of ear infections? He, he had a rupture two nights ago out of nowhere. Hmm. Yeah, so, so eardrum perforations usually occur because of pressure building up behind the eardrum from infection, where pus is formed and it keeps expanding and finally it ruptures the very fragile membrane of the eardrum. There, I would probably blame eardrum perforations or rupture on infection and not just fluid behind the ear because usually fluid behind the ear is relatively benign. It doesn't cause it to rupture. Um, that's a good, I'll talk to you offline about that. Thank you. Sure. All right, um, Marie on the stream says that uh, when they tested Dylan, none of the vaccines he's had showed up in his system, and he's had all available ones. Yeah, so that's right there. That's that. So if the part of the evaluation where we measure specific antibody titers or the response to vaccination is abnormal, where there's no protective antibodies, that pretty much defines a form of antibody deficiency, right? Yeah. So that right there says that there's definitely a, uh, a, a, a deficiency in the ability to make antibodies. And a decision needs to be made on whether to treat that, either in a patient who's otherwise healthy to watch and wait and not act upon that, whether it's prophylactic antibiotics um, in some fashion, or whether it's antibody replacement with 
IV or subcutaneous immunoglobulin. That's something that you need to have a discussion with your immunologist to decide what the best thing is for your, you know, for your child or family member. This is related to the last two questions. What is it with me and the mic? Okay. Um, this you is have bad vibes. I know. <laughs> Um, it's related to the last two questions, which is um, on the immunology tests we did years ago, some titer showed up and not all. Definitely things he'd had, like he had RSV and actually was hospitalized for that. He had titers for RSV, but he um, did not wind up having some of the titers for the routine vaccinations, which is why we're doing the Pneumovax 23. We're in the process of doing that study. My question is, if He's responsive to some and not others. What are the indications for continued vaccination? Is it that you have to do more vaccinations to stimulate? If, he, if it's like a, a response that's a minor response as opposed to the larger response, do you basically repeat the vaccines more times with your kid until you get the response you're looking for? Or Yeah, so it's really probably related to um, the... The normal immune response, which is to make a, a, a high or a large amount of antibody in the first few months after vaccination, and a slow trend downward over time. So many times when we measure antibodies in someone who has not been vaccinated for quite a long time, the protective levels are quite low. That doesn't necessarily mean there's anything abnormal going on. But with repeat vaccination, which I think is what's happening now, the patient should be able to respond quite quickly and make protective antibodies that will be maintained at protective levels for a certain amount of time. That's why all of us need tetanus vaccination every 10 years, because there's an expected loss of protection over time. That's not abnormal. What is abnormal is either the inability to make that initial response, right, or if those protective levels drop precipitously quite quickly, where the immune system can respond, but there's not a sustained protective response over time. And that's something else. That's the memory part, those memory B cells that we see being abnormal in Jacobson and other immune deficiencies. So would you just keep immunizing him? So that's a good question. So I think in a patient who initially responds and um, loses over the predicted period, you can immunize again and get a nice response. If a patient fails to respond to a vaccine the first time, specifically with Pneumovax, it probably is not beneficial to continue to hyper-immunize them with the intent of overcoming that defect. That defect is hardwired into the immune cells. They're deficient. They just can't make that response. There may be benefit, however, in some patients if they fail to respond to one type of vaccine. So I mentioned earlier that Prevnar is the vaccine that we give in the first year of life, and Pneumovax is the vaccine that we give later on. So for patients who don't respond to Pneumovax, there may be some clinical benefit to receiving, this is getting complicated, but there may be some clinical benefit to giving Prevnar in order to stimulate one of the immune responses that we all have in the first year, right? So the sort of um, immature immune response in order to keep kids healthy and produce some antibody. But it doesn't mean that things are normal. Well, everybody should be able to respond to Pneumovax, too. Sure. Yeah, so there's some, there's some thought that maybe giving uh, a dose of Prevnar on a clinical basis would help to prevent pneumococcal disease but it would not prevent any other infection other than infection with that specific bacteria, and it probably would only protect them to the strains of the bacteria that are included in Prevnar. So Prevnar protects against 13 strains of the 
pneumococcal bacteria, whereas Pneumovax, which is a different type of vaccine, protects against 23 strains of it. That, We don't always culture bacteria from every pneumonia, but we know the we know the um, the likelihood of the bacteria sometimes based upon what the X-ray looks like, what the clinical picture looks like, and oftentimes we assume based on statistics that it's pneumococcus or streptococcus pneumonia because that's the most common one. Sometimes we assume it's uh, a bacteria called mycoplasma, which is also very commonly seen in immune deficient patients, and we pick an antibiotic that we know will cover any of those offenders. Mm -hmm. Probably not. I, I think that I would pick to do an x-ray if I had a clinical dilemma in my head and I wasn't sure what I was going to make, what decision I was going to make. But if my decision was going to be to treat with antibiotics, no matter what I saw in the x-ray, I would just go ahead and treat with a broad spectrum antibiotic, especially in a patient who has a syndrome with a known antibody deficiency. I would probably treat with antibiotics earlier in the course of illness. I would treat probably with a higher dose than is recommended for the general population. And I might also treat for a longer period of time then I would treat an otherwise healthy individual. So for our patients with immune deficiencies that we treat with antibiotics for a presumed sinus, ear, or lung infection, we treat for a period of time that is sometimes almost double what we would in an otherwise healthy kid. So if the recommendations are to treat for a course of seven to 10 days, we will often treat for 14 days in order to make sure that we eradicate the bacteria completely because the underlying immune system is only partially or non-functional. Say if a child is getting like, sorry, two pneumonias over the course of several months, that what's really happened is that the bacteria may not have been entirely eliminated the first time around. Yep. And so if you can knock it out with one course of antibiotic, they're not going to wind up on it three months later or two months Correct. later. Okay. So we try to treat with longer periods of antibiotic at higher doses for that reason, which is to completely eradicate the bugs so that they don't get sick again. And also because we don't want to breed resistant strains of bacteria because shorter courses of antibiotics are related to the development of resistant strains that then become more difficult to treat. And remember that it's the bacteria that becomes resistant to the antibiotic, not the patient becoming resistant to the antibiotic. That's a very common question that I get. But what do you think? I mean, if you look uh, or you hear her case, talking about two to three pneumonias a year, mm -hmm. a little while, and then we had a year where he was not on antibiotics at all, like for anything, ear infections or pneumonias, and I thought he was growing out of it. And then last year, we had a year where he had two pneumonias and a strep. And then this year, it was like, I couldn't believe how great his immune system was, given the fact that we had a toddler in the house who was bringing home something new every week and a half. And I, he didn't get most of it, and he was doing great. And then in May, he showed up with a more aggressive pneumonia than I've ever seen him have. Um, not ever seen him have, I should say, than I've seen him had in years, because usually his pneumonias don't come with a fever. Usually it's just like the cold sticks around eight days, and then he starts sounding like he's rattling, and then I'm going, okay, it's the sound, we gotta go to the, the doctor. But this time around, it came on full throttle with a fever and a rattle at day, on day two, and that's actually not the way it typically shows up for him. So it was kind of threw us a little bit for a loop because you're like, oh, this seems a lot more aggressive than we usually see it. It's another example of how it's not predictable, right? Exactly. It may change over time. Yeah.
And I don't know. So there are other reasons why you can have recurrent pneumonias, and I don't know everybody's you know medical history, but for patients who may have had cardiac problems, who were maybe intubated and ventilated in an ICU setting, that can impact your lung tissue over time. Most patients outgrow that, but prolonged intubations and uh, dependence on a ventilator early in life can really predispose kids to some, I guess, respiratory um, illnesses throughout their childhood. They may be more susceptible for structural reasons. It can cause some... Intentional scarring to get rid of repeated chest tubes he was having after his heart surgery. Yeah, and so, so, there's reasons, so there's other reasons why bacteria may, I guess, gravitate to certain areas of the lung. So if there's certain areas of the lung that are poorly ventilated for scarring reasons, that may be a place where bacteria are colonized, and every so often they rear their ugly head and create a, um, so a superimposed sort of infection. And there's, even in otherwise healthy kids, there's some areas of the lung that are notorious for being, um, for harboring bacteria if they're poorly ventilated. You know, so start trying to notice if these infections are occurring more right around the area of the scar tissue. So that would be very helpful. So I was just about to ask is, do the infections always occur in one side of the lung or one area? No, but I, I, um, I can start looking to yeah, see just if a pattern about, is happening mm -hmm. now that I yeah. have that thought. I'm just going to use this one right here because he's right here. Um, so going back to the ear infection thing, um, we also have a situation where my son's, his ear perforates maybe three times a year, um, but he, he hasn't had a fever with an ear infection or like let us know pain-wise. Neither of my boys have had fevers in probably at least 10 years, which I think is very odd. Is that a normal thing? Or can that be related to an immune problem? Because yeah. he's having yeah, so ear infections because his I mean, his ear is perforating, but we don't know until it's perforated that he has an ear infection because there's no signs. Yeah, that's a very difficult question, actually. I mean, <clears throat> uh, so you just end up with the ear perforation uh, right. without preclinical or pre uh, yeah. signs, yeah. So it's, I think it's a different. Uh, uh, presentation of clinical symptoms per person. And I would not say that it's really related to any kind of condition. I mean, right, It's not concerning that they don't actually run fevers anymore? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I get that question all the time at meetings, and I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> this whole It'd be really helpful the, for me to know of, if they're right. sick. <laughs> so the lack, so it's, it's complicated. So the yeah. lack of fever in patients with immune deficiency is something that we hear about. Yeah. But yet we also hear about patients who are constantly running fever with, right. Ev right, with every infection. They're always sick. They have fever and cough, et cetera. So I don't know why some patients just don't have that mm -hmm. ability to mount a febrile response. It's, okay. it's complicated. Well, that's the thing. I mean, but I've heard that story with other syndromes, too. Okay. I mean, they used to have fevers when they were little. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to have pneumonias all the time, ear infections, we'd always have fevers, but I would say in the last 10 years, neither of them have run a fever. And yeah. I feel like that's a little bit strange. How old are they now, Lindsay? 19 and 16. Yeah, that's why. It's because they're, okay. the older you get, I haven't had a fever probably in years, okay. to be honest. So I have as, you, as the older you get, the less likely you are to have um, a fever, fever yeah, okay. and, and be clinically affected by these viral infections. I've had colds. But yeah. no fever, really. Okay. And then my other question is, we talked about the immune um, problems with the T cells or B cells potentially getting worse as you age. Can they get better as you age? Like, can you grow out of those type of deficiencies? Because my boys were, I mean, I feel like both of them, we spent the first five years in the hospital all the time. Like, all sorts of infections from lots of pneumonias, but like to cellulitis and stuff like that. And then suddenly, like, they just grew out of all that, and we haven't had a lot of pneumonias or anything like that since then, so I was like, did they 
have immunodeficiency and then they grew out of it? Or do they still, I mean, they might still have it and it's just showing in different ways? Yeah, if I may comment. Um, yeah. So what you can see there are, I think, also different answers that are possible. And uh, what you see uh, for adults, you see, let's say, if you are let's 21, you have a normal immune system. Your immune system declines over time. Right. And when you are uh, 80, over 80, you see a significant decline in number of B cells, T cells, antibodies. So that's the normal development of the immune system. And I think what you can see also in the general population that when you are born, the immune system is like here, then it develops over time, and then it declines over time. So this is also a normal development in the initial period of life. Okay. You have an increase in immune cell function and gradually going down over time. So when you say this is uh, uh, an early life problem, infections, then infections don't seem to be a problem anymore. Yeah. It could be that it is in this ongoing yeah. development. And we still have like ear infections and they have like toenail funguses that we cannot, like we treat them and then they come right back. And so I, I had never thought of the toenail fungus as being related to their to immunodeficiency, but is that something that could be could be. Yes, that, that, that's what we discussed indeed, that the okay. potential problems in T cell function yeah. might be related to fungal infections. Okay. And what I uh, also, that's uh, the, the other answer I uh, wanted to give is, uh, there could be a combination of immune cell defects and also anatomical things. Uh, uh, so if you are growing older from child to adult, things change anatomically. Right. So it could also be that indeed uh, at early stage of life you have problems with clearing infections. Right. Not because of the immune system, but because of the anatomical different uh, uh, composition. Mm -hmm. And that's over time also develops and then you get rid of these recurrent ear infections. So it could be a combination immune cell development, or immune cell function development, and also changes in anatomical conditions over time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Marie on the stream. Uh, she has to say that uh, she just wanted to clarify in Dylan's situation, with no response to vaccines, giving him pneumovax or similar flu shots would not be advised? Um, I don't... It's hard to comment on that because I don't know all the specifics about the lab testing, but both of those vaccines are, um, they're, they're safe to give because they're killed vaccines. So both the flu vaccine as well as Pneumovax doesn't put a patient at risk for any problems. But if a patient has poor vaccine responses, it doesn't make sense to continually immunize them, right, for no impact. Maybe with some expect, exception, uh, would be the flu vaccine, actually. So seasonal influenza vaccine may be, may be a little bit more complicated in the way that it works. And so even in patients that have some immune deficiencies in my practice, like CVID and other hypogammaglobulinemias, we recommend annual flu vaccine because there may be some, some partial benefit without a lot of risk. So we actually immunize those patients even knowing that their antibody production is kind of poor. Any other questions? Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? And if you're shy and you want to ask individually, that's fine too. <laughs> okay. All right, perfect. Sawyer. Sorry. <laughs> Just a couple notes that I wanted to make. Um, obviously, we did not cover everything Jacobson syndrome re medically related today. There are a lot of things that we just couldn't fit into the conference, but we have um, covered at previous conferences, such as the bleeding disorders, um, GI problems, vision, hearing, all that type of stuff that have been covered it, in previous conferences. And now those talks are all online for you to go and watch. I just wanted to make that clear that just because we haven't covered it doesn't mean it's not an issue. <laughs> So. <laughs> okay, I think um, then that's it for the day. Um, let's give them all a round of applause. Yeah.